we've got some bags of peppers back there. Some are uh, bell peppers and some are, um, I don't think they're hot peppers, like banana peppers or something. But if anybody would like some of those, or if you want to take all of them for a uh, for serve, um, they don't cost you a dime. Just uh, pray for the people that grew them. How are they doing? I guess. I don't know. Anyway, uh, but good evening to you. I appreciate you uh, being patient with me while I was running around. We just got done with a crazy worship practice. And so, uh, and it was a good one. I was happy about it. But uh, anyway, but welcome to our new format. Wednesday in the Word, and I know the times I've done Wednesday in the Word before, it's been when I've had to do a video because of COVID or a hurricane or, you know, active shooter or whatever it was we had out here. Uh, but we're going to just start calling this uh, on Wednesday nights, we're going to call it Wednesday in the Word. And I want you to feel comfortable with if you have a question uh, to just, you know, raise your hand if you have a statement that you want to make. I mean, if there's something that as I'm teaching you something that the Lord just really deals with you about, you want to say, hey, you know what I just realized, or, or something like that. Now, that being said, please don't take over and, and uh, you know, talk for 20 straight minutes because that's going to be a problem. So, uh, but you know, I do want you to feel free, though, if you have a question, especially, to be able to just uh, go ahead and say something. Now, I don't want anybody to be intimidated. I know that there's some that get intimidated with the camera. Um, were you able to zoom in here? Okay. But we are wanting to still stream because there are still people that uh, like to try to um, uh, watch us uh, with all of our services. So we do still want to stream. And the only reason I'm using the mic is so that the phone will pick us up. So there you go. But anyway, uh, all right, I, I'm going to say just a couple of real quick uh, announcements. And then we're going to get right into uh, what we're going to be studying about tonight. Um, first of all, uh, like I said about peppers, so first come for a serve, don't go now. Wait till after service. Uh, but then don't forget Sunday is homecoming. And we have the shepherds coming. I don't know if you remember when they were here back in 21. We had an amazing service. I think they only got through like four songs before the Holy Ghost just took over. So uh, it was a great time. But uh, they're going to be here on Sunday. We will not have Sunday school this Sunday because the group's going to be setting up. And so they'll need the sanctuary. So we're just going to give you a break on that. And so we will begin service at 1030 on Sunday morning, and uh, no Sunday school, but we will still have prayer. Uh, those of you who have been coming into the prayer room, we will still have prayer. I think we're going to move it just to 930, just to give you a few extra minutes of sleep. Uh, we'll move it to 930 uh, in the prayer room on Sunday, and we'll pray over the service, because like I said, just because we have a singing group, and just because it's a special day, I still want the Lord to <coughs> So uh, if you're able to make it to prayer, that will be at 930 this week, and then service will begin at 1030. Um, let's see, other announcements that I need to make. Men's ministry is, is it tomorrow? No, it's next Thursday. Next Thursday, it's men's ministry. Okay, uh, good. Uh, so we got that. And um, But tomorrow is my lovely wife's birthday. And so happy birthday. It says for Christ, y'all. And uh, she looks great for 57. All right, we're going to uh, <laughs> we're going to open up a prayer. I especially need it now. Uh, protection is what I'm going to be praying. No, we're going to open up a prayer and then uh, get right into uh, the word tonight. And uh, since we're in here, we're, we're not going to be taking up offerings on Wednesdays. But of course, you can always uh, give on Sunday, or if you like to give electronically, if you're okay with giving electronically through Venmo, you can also do that. And um, you know. We, we get that and we make sure it goes where it needs to be. We've not had any problems. We've been doing it now over a year, I guess. We've not had any problems at all with the electronic giving. So if that's what you want to do, or like I say, we'll just wait till Sunday and take care of it. Speaking of offerings, though, I do want to mention this. Since we do have a guest singing group, we are going to be taking up our regular tithe and offering, but then we're also going to be taking up a love offering. Um, it costs a lot for these groups to go out and to sing. And, you know, they try to put as much as they can in a, in a weekend. But uh, I don't know if you've seen the price of diesel and all that, but it's not cheap. So uh, let's, uh, we are going to be taking up two different offerings. So I just want to let you know so you're prepared that we will be taking up a love offering for the shepherds on Sunday. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we'll get right into the Lord today. Lord, we thank you and praise you for the beautiful day that you have given us. And God, I thank you for just everything that you are doing in our church, for the way that you have been moving and the way that you have been 
uh, just touching hearts and lives, and, and you've been making a change in us, God. And I thank you for it, and I praise you, because that change is drawing us closer to you. And Father, I pray that you will just be with us as we go into this Bible study time, as we begin to really dive into your word and begin to uh, uh, become greater disciples of Christ, not just followers, not just uh, Christians, but actual disciples of the word and of Jesus Christ. And I pray that you just quicken our minds and our hearts. I pray that you touch every need that's represented in here. We give you praise and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. One last thing I did want to mention as, uh, actually two more things I wanted to mention as far as announcements. Don't forget that we are having a girls' ministries fundraiser, spaghetti fundraiser on the 24th. On the 24th of September, uh, we're sending our girls to a retreat and we want to make sure that they're able to go and just have a great time. Everything's going to be focused on them. And so uh, let's, uh, if you're able to go to that, that's going to be on the 24th right after service that morning. And it's ten dollars a plate, and we would love to have your uh, assistance with taking care of that, uh, and maybe it'll help kind of jumpstart some of our girls' ministries again. But um, but also I wanted to mention about the see you at the poll information meeting that's going to be on the seventeenth of September at six o'clock at Hickory Grove, and at the same time at Life Givers in Bono, uh or Monk's Corner rather, excuse me, um, is the M25. Diaper run relay rally. rally. Oh, so that was this close. I said relay instead of rally. But that's going to be, that service is going to be at Life Givers on the 17th at 6 o'clock. And we are beginning to receive, we're going to have a box on Sunday that's going to be ready for you. Uh, we are beginning to receive uh, diapers and wipes. And if you would like to don uh, get some of those and donate them, uh, we would be more than happy to get those and bring them over to Life Givers. And those go to the boiler home. Uh, for those of you who aren't aware. All right. Uh, I think that's all that I need to talk about tonight. If you want to get your, uh, well, not all I need to talk about, but all I need to announce. If you get your Bibles out and you want to turn to 2 Kings and see now on Wednesdays, you're going to have to bring your Bible out because we ain't got the big old screen back there. So, you know, you can't be relying on electronics. A bunch of techies. But anyway, uh, 2 Kings chapter 6, and we're going to read verses 1 through 7. And I'm going to talk about something that you don't hear really preached about a whole lot or talked about a whole lot, but we're going to discuss a little bit as far as the significance of this miracle that happens in the, in the life of Elisha. All right, so 2 Kings chapter 6, starting in verse 1, says, And the sons of the prophets said unto Elisha, Behold now, the place where we dwell with thee is too straight for us. Let us go, we pray thee, unto Jordan, and take thence every man a beam. And let us make a place there where you may dwell. And he answered, Go ye. And one said, Be content, I pray thee, and go with thy servants. And he answered, I will go. So he went with them, and when they came to Jordan, they cut down wood. But as one was felling a beam, the axe head fell into the water, and he cried and said, Alas, master, for it was borrowed. And the man of God said, Where fell it? And he showed him the place, and he cut down a stick. And cast it in thither, and the iron did swim. Therefore said he, Take it up to thee. And he put out his hand and took it. So I just want to talk to you about the uh, the floating axe head. And um, you know, maybe if like I said, if you have some questions, we can get into that. But there's this is one of those things that it's like you sort of kind of remember if you've been in church a long time, you might kind of remember hearing something about it at some point. Maybe just in your reading, you kind of came across it and just moved on. It doesn't seem like it's really significant, but let me tell you, everything in the Bible is there for a purpose, amen? And so I want to take a look at this particular miracle, these seven verses, and what happened here. One thing I want you to notice first is where we are in this scripture. We're, we're starting at chapter 6, but what was going on in chapter 5? Uh, Ryan preached about it not that long ago on Wednesday night, I believe it was, uh, about Naaman and Naaman dipping into the, the Jordan River. He was full of leprosy and he was dipping in the river. And where he didn't go, um, unless my video cut off, where he didn't go was what happened after Naaman was healed. Naaman wanted to try to bless the man of God, wanted to try to bless Elisha because of what he had done. Because, of course, that's one of the problems when you work in the spirit, 
the Spirit works through you. People aren't focused on the Spirit. They get focused on you. If you don't believe me, then let me name just a couple of faith healers that have these huge ministries that are, are just covered in diamonds and jewels and all this and have all this money because they go and they heal all these people. When in all actuality, if, it, if it's actual, if it's real, and it's not you know some sort of scam, it's the Holy Spirit that's doing it. It's not, it's not the, uh, the vessel. And any time that you hear a preacher or an evangelist or a faith healer or anything like that, uh, anybody even who is working in the prophetic, where they begin to bring the focus on them, run away. Mm -hmm. Because they are not of God. Because if they truly are God, uh, of God, they're going to put their focus on God. They're going to say, no, 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 don't look at me. Let's look to the actual source. Let's look to the one that actually made this happen. I was nothing more than the vessel. But, especially people in the world, they don't understand that. And so, uh, Naaman was one of these where he wanted to, he was just so excited about being healed that he wanted to bless the man of God. And Elisha actually said that he wouldn't take anything for it at all. And, um, and so then he left. Well, his servant, Gehazi, who was Elisha's right-hand man, he was right there in the school of prophets along with Elisha. Gehazi was like, well, I don't think so. I'm not caring for this too much. Um, you know, my master has turned him away. Here he was. He was wanting to give us his money. Well, if, if Elisha don't want it, I'll take it. And once again, you've got uh, an example here of the man of God who is professing to be the man of God, but is also making sure the focus goes back on God versus the counterfeit. The one who saves the man of God, but yet his heart is with God. And we see that with, with pastors, unfortunately. We see that with evangelists. We see that with uh, different, like I said, different famous people, unfortunately. They get that focus on themselves, and, and they, it's taking the focus away from God. And God's one that actually did something. Gehazi is just like all the rest of those faith healers and, and prophets that, you know, I'm going to prophesy for money and all that kind of things. Just like the rest of them, I'm going to go ahead and take the rewards for something I didn't actually do. I was nothing but the vessel. It was God that did all the work. Well, Gehazi was saying, look, I'm not the one that, I, I mean, I, I told you, you know, what the master said, that you got to go and dip, but I had nothing to do with this, but I want some rewards. So he goes and he gets... Uh, a couple of talents of silver and a couple of changes of clothing, which uh, I love that Ryan had talked about, you know, what all these things actually added up to as far as in real dollars. Because we think change of clothing, you know, we're not thinking, you know, much, you know, but in these days and the kinds of changes of clothing we're talking about, it was very, very, very valuable. So he went and got this and he comes back and Elisha, you ever had your parents ask you a question and you kind of had the idea that they already knew the answer? They were just wanting to see what your answer would be. I've had that before, and sometimes I've caught on, and I've been like, they already know there's no point in lying. And other times I was like, I'm going to give it my best shot, and it never worked, because it's like, oh, really? Because your teacher called. I'm like, ah, I hate her so much. Anyway, but uh, but it was kind of that thing where Elisha comes, and he, he comes up to God, and he's like, hey, man, where have you been? And Gehazi flat out said, well, I ain't gone nowhere. He's like, you sorry sack of mud. Yes, you did. You went and you got this from Naaman and all this. And now, all the leprosy that Naaman had, it's now going to be on you. He even said it's going to be on you and your seed. So it's going to run in your family. Leprosy. And it says that Gehazi turned white as snow with leprosy. That's how chapter 5 ends. Now, here's the reason why I brought all that up. Look at the very first verse of chapter 6. And the sons of the prophets said unto Elisha, Behold now, the place where we dwell with thee is too straight for us. Now that word straight, it's not meaning just straight. It's meaning narrow. It's meaning crowded. What they were saying is that the school of prophets had now, where they were dwelling, had now become too small. And they needed to build. Isn't it interesting that they needed to build after they got rid of the counterfeit? Isn't it interesting? I mean, think about that for a second. It's, it's not... It's not a coincidence that it was after Gehazi was, was expelled from the school of prophets that now all of a sudden, because it doesn't say it happened immediately, it doesn't say it happened the next day, but now all of a sudden the school of prophets is blossoming, it's flourishing, it's grown to the point to where, you know, there's so many people wanting to come in and wanting to learn from Elisha and so many people that are craving a greater uh, relationship with God that now where they are is just too small. 
And uh, I think it's a lesson that the church needs to learn. Because we've gotten into this mode, in, especially pastors, especially pastors, have gotten into this mode where I'll do anything I can to hold on to every single person I've got. Because if I start losing people, then the people that are there are going to lose confidence in me, and they're going to be saying, well, maybe we need another pastor, and all this kind of stuff, and I could be out of a job. So I'm going to hold on to everybody. But how many of you like to garden? You like to go out there and either either garden or like your your landscape and like maybe in your house, you know, all the plants look nice and all that kind of thing. What happens when you prune a tree? When you prune a bush? What happens? I mean, it obviously is losing mass, right? It's smaller than it was. Sometimes, depending on how much needs to be uh, be pruned, sometimes it can look flat, barren. Mm -hmm. It, it, I remember there was a bush that we had in our house in Georgia that I, I got the trimmers out because I mean, it was looking bad. It was looking awful. And I started trimming that thing. Though I had done it before. You know, I, I, I can do this. I started trimming that thing. By the time I got done, it looked like it was just a big old dead shrub like, that was just hoping to grow up to be a tumbleweed one day. And I thought, I'm dead. Because we were actually renting the house from my uncle, and I thought, he's going to kill me when he sees this. And he's coming, like, in just a couple of weeks, which is the whole reason why I was trimming. And little did I realize, I was going to vandalize the thing. And uh, I was really upset and thought, he's going to kill me. And he showed up, and he was like, no, it's fine. He said, it'll grow back. It'll be fine. And sure enough, it began to grow some more. Leaves began to come and fill it in and all that kind of thing. But at the time of the pruning, it looked pretty miserable. Understand that sometimes what has to happen in churches is you've got people who are not willing to go where God is wanting to take them. They, they were able to get here with you, but they're not wanting to go there with you. And sometimes you have to make the call because God is saying, I'm wanting to bring you here. And these people are saying, we're staying right here. And you've got to make a choice of whether to prune the branch and go where God is wanting you to go or to stay right where you are and just pray that these sucker branches, I think is what they call them, just pray that they don't drag you down and that they don't stop what God is wanting to do. And let me just tell you, they will every single time because they just did. Because God's wanting you to go over there and you've already said, no, God, I think I'm fine. Because if I, if I go over there, these people aren't going to come with me. And I don't want to lose them. They're my friends or they're good tithers or they're just butts in the seat. Or, I'm sorry, backsides in the seat. I don't want to be rude or anything. We're, that's too casual. Uh, anyway, but, uh, you know, they're just uh, over here. And so I, I, I don't want to lose them. I'd rather hold on to this. But understand that you're never going to get to the place where God wants you to be. And you hold on to all the things that the world has been putting in and all the things that are trying to hold you back. All the things that are trying to keep you down. That's why I talked about, you know, that there's some, some friendships that some people have that you just got to let it go. Mm -hmm. You know, there are some, some friends that you might have in your life, and, and I, mean, I know this isn't a popular thing to say, but there are some friends you might have in your life that are holding you back from being where God wants you to be because they're a bad influence. Because anytime you're with them, you've got to put away the Christianity card and start acting like them. Otherwise, they're going to think that you're the sorry you know, whatever, that you're the, the party pooper and all that kind of thing. If you want to get to that place that God is wanting you to go, though, you've got to trim those branches. The school of prophets wasn't able to grow until the, the county fit was removed. And so uh, they, they come to this and they tell Elisha, let me just hold that the whole time. They come to this and they tell Elisha, okay, listen, we've gotten so big and this house is just getting too small for us. We've got to do something else. And so they said, you know, let us go under the Jordan and take the every, every man a beam and let's make a place to dwell there. They were asking permission, you know, can we go and can we do this? And Elisha said, sure. You know what? Go ahead. Go ahead. That's fine. But look at verse 3. Isn't this interesting? you got this whole school of prophets, right? You would think the school of prophets would be the really, you know, they're, they're your real spiritual ones. I mean, they're going to school for this. They're learning straight from Elisha, the prophet of God for the nation of Israel. You know, they're learning from this man who, I mean, he's got a double portion of Elijah's anointing. We all know how incredible and powerful Elijah was as a prophet. And here's a man that they're learning from him. You would think that they would be the really spiritual ones, right? And yet, in verse 3, it says, And one said, 
Be content, I pray thee, and go with thy servants. And he answered, I will go. How many times in our lives do we get ahead of God and say, God, we want to do this, but we want to do this, and you know what, you know, Lord, I, I, I want you to... I want you to bless us and, and, and let us go and do these things. And you know, I want you to give us the money to do it. Or I want you to open the door for us to do it. And all that kind of thing. And, and, and so here I go, God. I'm just going in faith and I'm believing that you're going to do it. And we never bothered to ask God. It's okay. We never bothered to ask God. He was on board with it. You know, we get to this place where we're just saying, okay, well, God, I, I really want this. I, I had a dream. I had a vision about it. And I really believe that you're the one who gave me that vision. So I'm going to go. We forget to ask God to go with us. We forget to, uh, that happens a lot, if you see, with uh, people that are trying to um, take certain habits, trying to change things in their lives. They know that God wants them to get off drugs or alcohol. Or they know that God wants them to stop doing whatever action this is, that is that's a sin in their life. And they say, you know what, I'm going I'm to work on that and I'm going to give that to God and I'm going to make this happen. And they go forward, they forget to ask God to go with them. They forget to ask God to give them strength, to give them the power to be able to go and do these things. But there was one, thank God, excuse me, there was one that said, uh, you're going with us, right? I mean, we don't want to go by ourselves. We want you to go with, or at least I don't. I, I, want, I want the man of God there. We're going to be doing something. I want to make sure the man of God is there. Now, I think it's funny because I, I, I can almost picture Elisha. You know, when they were asking him, and he says, go ye. You know, go ahead. Go ahead and do that. And just wait to see who's going to come back. Which one of his people are going to come back and say, well, you're going to go with us, right? We want you to go with us. And he's just kind of sitting back there, and they all are just packing up their tools. And, oh, it's going to be great. And we're, oh, I'm, I, you know, I'm going to get uh, this, and I'm going to make this, and blah, blah, blah. You know what I'm picturing? I'm picturing a gazebo in the backyard and, and all these kinds of things. And then finally one comes up to him and goes, uh, please. Will you come with us? Understand that no matter how great of a thing it is that you're wanting to do, no matter how much you just know that God wants it to happen, if you don't go and ask God to go with you, you're asking for failure. You're asking for it to be a failure. Because if we do anything, listen, if, if I get up and I preach the word, and I don't pray about it first, and I don't say, God, would you lead me in what I'm supposed to be preaching? Would you lead me in what I'm supposed to be teaching? Would you show me the, the songs we're supposed to be singing or, or, or the sermons we're supposed to be, I'm supposed to be preaching or whatever it is? And I just say, you know what? I'm, gonna, I'm just going to bring the word. I'm going to bring this word because I like this one and I think this is great and I know that God's going to be pleased. What I'm bringing is still the word of God. What I'm preaching is still the word of God. But if I haven't asked God to go with me first, in fact, if I haven't asked God to go before me, and then be by each side and behind me as well. And be floating up here someplace too where I'm completely covered by nothing but God. I'm going to fail when I go. I'm going to fail at my preaching. I'm going to fail at my teaching. The word's not going to get through. We're not going to see the results that I'm hoping to see because I didn't bathe it in prayer and ask God to go with us. Anytime I, in fact, uh, I, I don't know if I shared it with, with y'all or not, but when I preached the revival over in Turbyville, I had... Four sermons I had even written them down. These are the four that I'm going to preach. I'm going to do these four. <coughs> and here we go, and that's it. And I did the first sermon, but the first sermon actually ended up going into the sermon that I preached that morning about the pig pen, and it kind of just melted into one big old sermon. And I was like, all right, well, that was interesting, but I got these other sermons. Well, then we come to Monday night, and I wasn't able to preach the sermon that God gave me, or that I thought God had given me for Monday night. And I was like, all right, well, that's fine. I got these other two. And that would be good. I get to I get to the service on Tuesday night. I have, I've got the sermon in my notebook. Everything's fine. Service is just about ready to start, and God all of a sudden says, "No, you're doing this." And I'm like making a mad dash and all that. And and you know my, my phone's on the tripod, so I'm having to borrow uh, Rusty's phone to look something up and, and all this kind of thing. And, and God's like, "No, you're going to do this one instead." And I'm like, Man, alive! And you know, I, I, at least give me one I've done before. You know that I'm comfortable with. And then uh, I was, I mean, I was already, I was going to preach on the Holy Ghost on Wednesday night. That's how I'm going to end this up. I'm going to preach on the Holy Ghost. And then Wednesday afternoon, God's like, nope. I'm like, okay, fine. But here's the thing. If I had preached those sermons that I wanted to preach, they would have been the Word of God. 
There would have been no blasphemy or no heresy there, but I can guarantee you I wouldn't have gotten the response that I did with the sermons that I obeyed and I said, you know what, Lord, I'm going to preach this instead because I'd rather you go with me than for me to try to drag you along. I'd rather you go with me. And, uh, and so we, we saw some great things happen, and I'm very grateful for what the Lord did in that revival. Um, and I'm just going to get through the rest of this, and then we'll get to a place where if you uh, have any questions or any comments, where we'll have an opportunity to say that. But uh, So we get to where um, Elisha says, okay, I'll go. And so they went with him, they began to cut down wood. And then it says in verse 5, but as one was felling the beam, the axe head fell in the water, and he cried and said, Alas, master. For it was borrowed. Now, this sounds like maybe he was a little bit of a crybaby. It's like, dude, you're crying about an axe head? I, I may have shared it with you. I don't know if I did or not, but I had done an object lesson in my very first church, and I've never done that sermon again, ever, ever, ever. But I did a sermon in my very first church, and I was like, all right, it's going to be one of these object sermons, really going to, uh, it's going to just cement in their heads. They're never going to forget it. And I was right. Um, I had a, a clay pot on a stand that I had my hammer with me. And I had my hammer the whole time I'm preaching. I'm just carrying around this hammer in this hand and the microphone in this hand. And they're just waiting. They know I'm going to do something with that clay pot. And I'm talking about being broken for God and, and, and all this kind of thing. And I finally said, you must be broken. And I went like this and I hit it with the side of the hammer. And that pot shattered and everybody went, <gasps> just like I wanted them to. And it was great. And I was like, yes, I really got through to them. And, and honestly, I don't know if the sermon itself was any good. But I mean, the pot shattered. That was great. And I bring that thing back and there is no head on that hand. <laughs> I've got a handle in my hand. And I'm looking, going, where did it go? It went and embedded itself into the wall behind me. I had not been at that church for a year yet. And I poked a big old hole in the wall with a hammer during a sermon. Guess where the anointing went? Right out the window. I didn't even bother finishing the sermon. Everybody, when they realized where that thing was, they started laughing. And I, my face just got hot and I'm turning red. And I'm standing there at the pulpit like this looking at my hammer, the head of it, in the wall. And I said... Let's stand and dismiss. And I dismissed the service, and they're laughing as they're standing. And I, my prayer was something like, Lord, thank you for showing us that we need to be broken. Amen. And that was about, I'm like, what else am I going to say? You know, what am I going to do? Have a salvation altar call? You know, it's like, unless you want to be embedded in hell like this hammer here. I mean, what was I going to do, you know? And so, uh, and I, just, I remember feeling so stupid. <laughs> And just being like, okay, we're going to take this sermon and we're going to put it in file 13. You know what I mean? Just put it in the trash can and we're never going to speak about it again. And of course, I've spoken about it my whole career because I learned something. Don't ever do that. But, you know, what was interesting, though, is that I was so focused on being able to smash that pot. You know what? I never checked the, uh, the connection that the hammerhead had with the handle. Never even looked at it. And apparently it was loose because I'm not that strong, especially left-handed. And I, I never bothered, I was so focused on this part, I never bothered to take a look at the tool that I had in my hand to see if it was able to do the job I wanted it to do. This man was so excited about building this, this new house, so excited about building this new school of prophets. Oh, you know, I'm going to be able to say I was a part of that. Maybe I can help, you know, uh, put this beam up and, you know, not, I'll write my name on it, you know, Jehoshaphat was here or whatever, you know, and I'll just kind of, I'm really looking forward to it. It's exciting and all this. And he never bothered to take a look at his tool to see if his axe was able to handle the job. And the thing was, he borrowed the axe. Now, the reason why this, this is important, the reason why he was really freaking out was this. Back in these days, you've got to understand that, uh, uh, until David came and destroyed the Philistines, uh, well, didn't destroy, but conquered the Philistines, the Philistines actually refused to allow the Israelites to have any iron tools. They couldn't have iron weapons. They couldn't have iron tools because the Philistines had them. So they knew that as long as they were still working with bronze, but we're working with iron, we got the advantage. It's, it's kind of like, you know, a, a shotgun versus a slingshot. 
you know, it, which David's was a pretty good slingshot. But anyway, but it, it's it's kind of that thing where they were, they always thought, okay, as long as we make it illegal for them to, and this is not going to be a gun control sermon, but as long as we make it illegal for them to own iron weapons, we've always got an advantage over them. And they'll never be able to conquer us because they've got bronze and our iron is just going to go right through that. So it had not been that long that uh, Israel had had access to iron weapons and iron tools. The fact that he had to borrow this shows that he didn't have the money to go and get one of his own. And so he was doing this and had borrowed it from a friend, a very expensive tool. I don't know what would be, because I'm not a tool guy, so I, I don't know what would be like an expensive tool now. You know, uh, maybe like a, a, a three or two, a snap. Well, I mean, I know the brains. You know, I see the snap on truck every now and again. I'm like, yeah, I can't afford it. But, uh, but like, uh, maybe like a 3D, you know, some of these 3D printers. Like if you had borrowed somebody's 3D printer and you were like, I'm going to make this. And you accidentally dropped your bowling ball on it. You know, I mean, it, it happened to Blaine, actually. But, no. Uh, but, you know, you had to raise your hand, you like, you have a bowling ball. Uh, no, but anyway, uh, you know, it, it, was, it was that kind of a level where it was something that was very expensive. Something that he wasn't able to, uh, to replace. But he didn't take care of what he had. How many of us are like that with the things of God? We bar I mean, all the power that we have of praying and seeing people get healed or, or praying and seeing people delivered or, you know, laying on of hands and, and seeing great things happen and all that, all of that is about borrowed from God, every bit of it. We only have the power that we have because God has said that he's going to give it to us. And he has offered that to us as willing vessels for him. But if we're not careful with making sure that our vessel is ready for the job, then that's when we begin to see things lost. That's when we begin to see things fail. That's when we begin to see problems come in. You know, you, I, I think about the, um, well, there was one guy I can think of in particular that uh, the Holy Spirit really used him in the prophetic. Um, he was a man that I, I saw him when he first kind of got, got going as far as uh, working in the prophetic spirit. You can say, oh, I don't believe in prophecy and all that kind of thing. Well, it's in the Bible, so there you go. But, um, you know, and there's nothing in the Bible that says that all that was for just the apostolics, and, you know, just the apostolic age. There's nothing in the Bible that says, and this is when all the power stopped and nobody had it anymore. It's still real for us today. And, and I completely believe in, in prophecy, and I completely believe in, in all the gifts of the Spirit. But this man in particular, he... Um, he realized that a shift had happened in his ministry. He was beginning to speak words of prophecy, and they were coming true, and, and, and everything like that. Well, it got to the point where everybody that booked him to preach at their church they expected a prophetic revival. They expected him to give a word of prophecy over every single person there. I went to a camp where he was, and here I was. I was 14 years old, maybe, something like that. 14, 15 years old, and he was the speaker of the camp. And he preached his sermon, and then he got up and, and uh, said, if you want a word from the Lord, then you get in line. Well, we didn't have a choice. Our counselors were saying, come on, you're getting in line. You need a word from the Lord. I'm like, oh, good. And so, you know, all these kids are getting up there, and we're in line, and, and over each and every one of them, he gave a prophecy. But he felt like he had to, because that's why they booked him for that particular thing. So the focus, once again, became on him. And instead of him seeking God, and instead of him saying, Lord, it's only through you that I speak these things. It's, you know, and so you will speak it as you desire, not as I desire. And then telling these people, don't look me for a prophetic revival because I have no idea if it's going to happen or not. That's why I've got to be honest with you. I don't understand these people that say, we're having a healing revival. Well, how do you know? What if God decides that none of those are being healed at that time? Now you you know, you've been advertising this, and now you look stupid. You know, like, I mean, oh, we're going to have we're going to have this prophetic revival, and this this prophet of God is going to come and, and bring these words to you personally. But well, maybe, but maybe not. It's not our call because it's not our power. It is borrowed from the Holy Spirit. We are nothing more than the vessels. You know, we're the we're the handles that are holding the axe head. All right. We're the, we're the ones that are trying to hold on to the power that God is, is giving. We're the ones that are trying to work in that power to the best that
that we possibly can and the best that God will do through us. And many times because we are faulty, because we have, have defects, because we are problem children of God, you know, a lot of times, you know, that, that power, you know, it, it gets lost. It gets lost to us. Because we need to go back to an altar of prayer. We need to get ourselves back with God. What ended up happening to this man, unfortunately, is he actually had a nervous breakdown. He had a nervous breakdown. Ended up going to um, a facility. I'll just put it that way. While he was in that facility, his wife left him. He, of course, lost his job. Nobody was wanting this man to come back because he was in a facility. And um, I, I didn't hear what happened to him after that. He got out. And never ministered again. He was a he was an axe handler who wasn't ready for the axe head. Wasn't ready for the actual instrument of power. And so we've got to be very careful about as we are working, especially the Pentecostals, as we are working in the spirit. We've got to make sure that it truly is the spirit. And you only know that by having a relationship with God. You know, when you first get started and, and when you first get baptized in the Holy Spirit and all that, it becomes a thing, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to be getting off topic here in just a second. So I'm going to try to reel it back in. Let me just say this. It becomes a thing where you almost feel a pressure at first because other people are trying to pressure you. Now you have to speak in tongues every single time that you pray. You know, now you have to, uh, you know, if you lay hands on something, you've been baptized in the Holy Spirit, so now they have to be healed. And if they aren't, then the problem's with you. And, and all this kind of thing. And it becomes a lot of pressure. But as you mature in the spirit, as you mature in those gifts, and as the Lord begins to teach you in those ways, and you can accept the things that God has for you, you become more comfortable in knowing. I mean, there have been times that I have known beyond the shallow of a doubt I was supposed to tell somebody something. It didn't make any sense to me, but it made a whole lot of sense to them when I finally told them. And then there have been other times that I got something in my head, and I was like, hmm, I'm thinking that may be more Chris than it is God. And I prayed about it, and sure enough, it was just me, and I had you know, too much pepperoni or something. You know, uh, I, I I just had kind of gotten off on a wild tangent. And God's like, yeah, like, reel that back in. You know, you're excited. I understand. Reel it back in. Let's get back to hear what I have to say. So, you know, we but we get to this place though where this man was not ready. He was not prepared. He wasn't paying attention to what was going on. He didn't realize that his axe handle was coming off of the head. He didn't bother to check it. Or he, he went and, and did what he was supposed to do. And because of that, the axe head fell into the water. Now, I don't know about you. I've never seen iron float. I, I still don't know how ships do it. But God bless them. You know, uh, it's it's an amazing thing. It's, it's a miracle, in my opinion. But um, I know it's just something as simple as physics. But I didn't take physics. So moving along from there. But, uh, but this axe head was not just going to float there on the top. And so he, he calls to the master. That's what he needed to do. He needed to speak to the man of God. He needed to get through to God for with his problem. Not so that say, well, let me figure out how I can do this myself. I'm sure I can go diving into the river. I'm sure it's just right there and I'll find it and all this kind of thing. He didn't do that. He went right to God. Can we please get it in our heads that it's through his power and through his strength that we're going to be conquerors, not through our own. Can we please get it to our heads? If we will just recognize we have a problem and then go directly to the master instead of trying to figure it out ourselves if we don't want to bother him. He doesn't mind us bothering him in these situations because he wants to bring us deliverance. But he says, alas, master, for it was borrowed. And he let him know that, you know, I don't have the money for this. I can't replace this. And the man of God said, where fell it? And he showed him the place. And he cut down a stick and cast it in thither, and the iron did swim. And I've as I was reading about this, I was reading some commentaries about it, that sort of thing. Um, the thing that kind of kept coming up with the different uh, uh, people that were making the comments, uh, that were doing the commentaries, uh, they were saying about how the sit uh, represented the cross. Because here it was, there was something that could not be, could not be retrieved on its own. Something that had fallen into the depths. Something that it looked like it was lost forever. But then he threw a stick in the water. And that thing floated up out of the clay, out of the mire, out of the muck at the bottom of the river. It floated up. And you know, we even talked about uh, when uh, Brother Ryan was preaching about this, about how the Jordan River was, was 
you know, pretty dirty compared to some of the other rivers that they even wanted to go and they didn't. So we're back at the Jordan River, the dirty Jordan River, and here it is. It, you know, it's basically just a place for catfish, and that's about it. You know, the, the mud, mud bugs and whatever. And this iron head is down there someplace. It's lost, but then the stick is introduced, and it's drawn out of the mire and comes up to the surface and comes up to where the stick is, and it floats, and the man's able to go, and he's able to reach out and put it in his hand. So, um, like I said, there been a lot of these uh, commentaries I was reading that were we're saying how that was representative, even just that part, if you just take those verses right there, how it was representative of what Christ did for us because we were stuck in the mud, we were lost, never to resurface again, we were just in the mire, in the muck, that's where we were, but then there was a stick that was introduced, the cross was introduced, and it drew us up miraculously because your salvation is not just an act. It is a miracle, without question, because old things are passed away and all things are become new. But this, uh, it drew us up out of that mire and drew us to the cross, and we were saved, and we, we were able to function. We were able to be put back. What, did he, what do you think this man did when he pulled the axe out? You think he just put it in his pocket and said, I'm just going to hold on to you until we're all done with this house? I'm sure he went and he put it back on that handle and he made sure that it was where it needed, or the way it needed to be and it was secure and I'm sure he went right back to work. And we get drawn up out of that mire and we get drawn to the cross and then God is able to put us into the work that he's wanting us to do. So as you see in this, it's just seven verses. And like I said, you don't hear it preached a lot, you don't hear it taught about a lot. Um, at least I don't. I, I don't know honestly if I've ever heard but maybe one sermon where it even referenced this particular miracle. But this is what happens when you study the word and you begin to look at it more than just I'm reading these verses. You begin to look and say, well, what is actually being done here? What's 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 the what's the idea that I'm needing to learn here? What is God trying to teach me here? And we begin to see there's so many things that we're able to glean from that. So um, with all that being said, you know, I just kind of wanted to go over that. And uh, just wanted to see, you know, as far as, um, first of all, how many of you were already familiar with this particular passage? You already knew about this miracle? And, and okay. Um, I just kind of want to get, uh, see if uh, any of you have any thoughts or any ideas, anything that you wanted to share concerning this and concerning um, uh, the miracle of the axe head. I, I know it's not anything like, uh, you know, well, he, he prayed the entire army was stricken with blindness. I mean, that's one of those things, man, that's, that's exciting, you know. Um, or uh, I'm going to take this mantle and I'm going to smack the river and it's just going to part. I'm going to walk across it. I mean, that's that's pretty phenomenal. You know, that's a big deal. And this doesn't seem like much. It's like, okay, well, you save this guy the embarrassment and have to go with his friend and say, hey, I got your axe. Uh, you know, that snap on axe. That you, that you, uh, lonely, uh, yeah. I brought half of it back. You know, probably not the half that you were looking for, though. <laughs> but, um, but anyway, just, I, I just wanted to see, you know, if there's anything that, that you are wanting to share, anything that maybe the Lord has laid on your heart concerning, um, any of the, the items that we talked about here. Uh, I'll tell you this, the one that the really seems to stick out to me is actually verse one, where it says that, Suddenly the place became too small for them. Because I just think, how how many churches would be looking at building programs? How many churches would be looking at having to add on if we would just allow the counterfeit to leave? If we would just if not, now let me say this before I get myself in trouble. I'm not saying I want us to start listing people in the world that need to go. <laughs> I'm not saying that. I'm not saying I don't already have a list at home, but I'm, no, I'm saying, no, uh, no, I'm not saying that. And I'm not going to actively try to kick anybody out, okay? Uh, now, it, it depends. Now, if you cause trouble, that's a whole other story. But, you know, I mean, I'm not looking to kick anybody out. And I, what I would love is for everybody to get on board and for us all to go together. So I don't want anybody to think, well, Pastor, you're sitting there talking about how he wants to kick people out of the church. No, I do not. Uh, sometimes. But I get over it. You know, that's fine. But um, 
But I do think that, like, there are even traditions that we hold on to that just need to go. There, there are things that, well, we've always done this. Let that go. And watch what God does. You know, well, we, we've always had this service, or we've always done it at this time, or we've always had, you know, this person's always been in charge of this, or this, you know, da, 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 da. That's all great and wonderful, but the thing is, if you're wanting to move forward, some things have to be left behind. Mm -hmm. And hopefully it's not going to be any people. Hopefully it's going to be more, like I said, our traditions or our mindsets or something like that. But uh, but I didn't want to clarify that and make sure nobody leaves here thinking pastors got a hit list. Got a crystal does. But, uh, I, no, I didn't want anybody to think that. So. Yes, sir. Say, you know what? I think you're done singing. Boom. I would not be able to carry a tune. 
I would not, I've, I've seen it where people, their voices just kind of went away. And, or or uh, I, I remember one man, and I'm not saying he was being punished by God, but I'm just saying that this was something that happened. Uh, when I was a kid, I remember he, uh, he had, him and his family were in a singing group, and they came to our church several times, and he was a private pilot and all that kind of thing. It was kind of neat because they would do these uh, vacation Bible school things, and which whoever raised the most money got to fly on this guy's plane with him. And so it was really kind of cool. Well, there was one time that they were flying to uh, someplace they were going to be singing, and they end up having an accident, and everybody survived, thank God. Uh, but he ended up getting hit in the throat, and for three years, he could not speak. He had no ability to make sound out of his mouth whatsoever. This was a man who sang for a living. And I'm, once again, I'm not saying God was punishing him, but what I'm saying is that we don't know from day to day what we're going to be able to do. Look at these football players that today they're worth... You know, well, they say they're worth $50 million a year to play a ball game, you know, because they're the biggest and the baddest and all that. And suddenly they get a, a, a broken leg and now nobody wants them, you know, or, or uh, who was the gentleman that uh, he had the, the cardiac arrest for the bills? Yeah, uh, DeMar Hamlin. Okay, DeMar Hamlin played for the Buffalo Bills. He's an athlete. I mean, he, and he was, he was good at what he did was on the field one day, stood there, and fell down, had a cardiac arrest. He survived. But how many people do you think are just dying to have him back on the field for him? Oh, we're going to sign him. You know, we got to sign a heart attack boy. You know what I mean? It, you know, it can be taken at any time because God is sovereign. Because all of our abilities, all of our talents, all of our gifts, all of our power is only given to us by God. That's it. You can say, well, I earned the money that I've got. No, you got the money that you got because you work hard, but God gave you the ability to work hard and to be able to do that. Because there's lots of people that work hard that don't have anything. So it's, it's all because of the grace of God. All right. Anybody else? You kind of... yeah. I've seen that happen many times. It's like, hey, God, well, I mean, like I said, with my revival... And I, I can just imagine, because so I was sitting in my office, it was it was the last day of the prayer vigil, and I was sitting in my office, and I actually wrote down uh, on a piece of paper right now, because this one, this one, this one, this one, yeah, okay, that's going to be a good line, and, I'm, and God's probably just up there going, <laughs> or maybe he was okay with it, he was like, you know, I'm just going to mess with Chris for a while, and I'm going to make him preach something else. I, I don't know, you know, maybe he did it just to shut me up, I don't know, but I mean, it, it, I, I listened to him, and it worked, and that's the important thing. All right. Uh, I do want to tell you uh, some things that are coming up, some things that we're, we're going to be studying uh, in here. Um, we're going to be looking at some of the kings of Israel. Uh, if I were to ask you to name some kings, you could probably name a few. I'm sure everybody would say Saul, we would say David, and uh, you know maybe you remember Saul. But we're going to look at some of the kings of Israel and some of the things that, that they did in their lives. Not everybody, but some of them uh, in particular that really stuck out. Uh, there's also a book uh, by Mark Rutman called uh, David the Great that I've uh, been reading. That, uh, in fact, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, I believe they taught it over at Georgetown uh, uh, last year, if I'm not mistaken. But uh, we're going to talk some about David in depth, about his life and about who he was, and kind of give you some new, uh, some new views about David, and uh, maybe look at him in some ways that possibly you didn't think about before. And, uh, and see just, you know, why the Bible says he was a man after God's own heart. We're going to be looking at uh, the Holy Spirit in depth. We're going to be looking at some uh, some other things. But uh, but I'll try to announce the, those series in advance so that you can kind of read up a little bit, maybe get some questions and that sort of thing. But uh, but I do want you to feel comfortable. And I know it's hard because I don't shut up. So <laughs> that's why you got to raise your hand. It's like... Be quiet for a minute. I've got something to say, but um, but I do want to give you an opportunity uh, to ask questions and, and that sort of thing. And uh, uh, and if there's like I said a comment that you'd like to make, just let me know, and I'll be happy to let you say something. All right, all right. We um, I still got six minutes, so I'm going to do a tap dance. <laughs> now uh, I appreciate you all uh, being here tonight.
Please don't forget about our announcements. Don't forget about homecoming. It's at 1030, not at 11. Be here at 10 for, of course, you should be here at 10 for Sunday school anyway. But, uh, but our prayer uh, cell will be, uh, will be in the prayer room uh, at 9.30 instead of 9.15 this week. Just give you a few extra minutes of sleep and rest. And, uh, but we are going to pray before homecoming because, like I said, I, I, want there to be another, I want there to be another outpouring of the Holy Spirit. I'd love it if the shepherds only got through two songs. They probably would love that too. But uh, before the Holy Spirit just really poured out upon us. But uh, be praying for the service on Sunday. And uh, I know the Lord is going to uh, going to bless. Uh, I would also like to ask you to just be praying for uh, us for actually traveling. Uh, I mentioned about the stirring and um, that ministry event that's happening in Savannah. That's actually going to be happening Friday. So we're going to be traveling to that on Friday. And I want to thank Oak Grove, by the way. Um, I, I, I was blown away by the giving uh, that the church gave to a ministry that you guys have never met these people yet, because I plan on bringing them at some point, but you've never met these people. Uh, it's not in South Carolina, it's in Georgia. They need Jesus too. Uh, and uh, and yet, you just went on my recommendation of some people that I just have faith in and I believe in, and their ministry, and you gave, and we were really able to bless them from our church. So thank you very much for your generosity. Uh, I, I was... I was so thrilled to be able to, uh, to send that to them, and, and they were shocked, and, uh, and so anyway, but uh, thank you very much for that. But be praying for us for safe travels, and we'll be back sometime on Saturday, and we'll be ready for church on Sunday, all right? All right, let's pray and we'll dismiss today. Father, thank you so much, Lord, that we know that we have the power to do so many different things for the kingdom of God. But it's only because of you. We are nothing in ourselves but willing vessels. God, I pray that you'll help us to be vessels that are sanctified, that are consecrated, that are ready to be used by you and by your Holy Spirit. God, I pray that you will help us to pay mind and pay attention to the things that you're doing through us, Father. And Lord, for us never to have the focus on ourselves, but to always direct it back towards you. And God, I pray that you will help us to have a wonderful week the rest of this week. Uh, those that are, are sick and are, are feeling ill, Lord, would you just strengthen them and help them and, and bring uh, peace to their bodies. Lord, I pray that you will just protect each and every one of us and give you glory and honor and praise because you alone are worthy of it. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen. Amen. Don't